Hey everybody, it's the Scholar General Mojan and Bing. Uh, today's an extra special day on the channel because I'm talking about pole arms. In the past I've had, you know, dozens of requests to talk about pole arms on this channel and I've never talked about them much until today. And that is because I'm doing a review of this LK Chen Batwing Han Sha. Now, this was, like many of the other LK Chen products that I've reviewed on my channel, this one was sent to me for the purpose of video review, but I actually ended up liking it enough that I've purchased it for myself. Uh, so that just kind of spoils some of my thoughts about it, but uh, don't worry about that. There's a lot more to share and let's start like all my reviews by first talking about the history and then talk about some of the specifics of this one that I have here and then I'll go out and, you know, talk about some use and cutting and stuff like that. So the Sha is a polearm and what we would probably call a sword staff in English and um, basically you have a staff with a sword on the end of it. Um, if this was blade was a little shorter, I might be tempted to call this a hewing spear or like a cutting spear. But because this blade is, you know, like 22 inches or 50 centimeters or so, I, I would just call this a sword staff. So the basic term sha just refers to a sword staff like this with a kind of guard. Now some guards can be a little bigger than this one. Uh, this one has this particular shape, which is why it's called the batwing han sha. Uh, but if we really want to talk about the Sha, eh, we can't really tell its story without first talking about a related weapon known as the Peep. So the Peep is the original sword staff in China and it's quite ancient and the main difference between the Peep and the Sha is that the Peep does not have a guard which protrudes perpendicular to the blade. It might just have a little bar here or something else but it doesn't have any kind of really guard to it. It's mostly just an attachment to the shaft. Every P will consist of three parts, which is the blade, the handle, and the end cap. One of the things that makes P really interesting is that for a long time archaeologists didn't really know that what they were and how it existed. And uh, basically we have textual sources that uh, have the character P in it, but we didn't really know what it referred to and the descriptions were quite vague, uh, but in addition to that, because it's a sword staff and you literally just have a sword on the end of the staff, a lot of the archaeological finds of Peep uh, were just assumed to be swords, and it's only later that we started to realize that they're actually meant to be affixed to a long shaft and be, be a polearm. Back in the 1970s, there was a Japanese archaeologist who proposed that some of the bronze jin, or double-edged straight swords, that they were finding in graves were actually meant to be attached to a shaft and his theory didn't really catch on until years later whenever they you know were unearthing the terracotta warrior pits and they discovered actual sword stabs with the the basically the sword attached to the, the shaft and they could see remnants and the impression of the shaft in the dirt and uh, with that discovery there was a recontextualization of previous swords and they had to go back and look at uh, past archaeological digs and find out were all of them just swords, were some of them actually sword stabs, and which ones were and how can you tell, that kind of thing. And after years of hard work by archaeologists reanalyzing burial contexts and more finds, we now have a more clear picture of the history of the P and then its development into the Sha. The story of the P basically begins with the transition from the Western Zhou to the Eastern Zhou Dynasty, uh, which can also be called the Spring and Autumn Period. So it's like the 8th century BC. And by that point, you're well into the Chinese Bronze Age. And some of the more common weapons around are the spear, or the mao, and the jin, which is the straight double-edged sword. Now, the pi was basically the fusion of these two weapons. The very earliest P were sometimes attached in a similar manner to very early bronze spearheads where they would have some kind of nodule or something, a hole that you could tie them to the shaft with. Um, however, over time, uh, there were some improvements in design and they came up with two ways to affix the blade to the shaft. One of them is to make a socket and then the other one is to make a tang, or a, a kind of a piece that goes inside the handle. Across the world, many pole arms are either socketed or attached to the shaft with a tang. And um, both of these are pretty strong. They have some pros and cons. In general, 
It's believed that the socketed pull arms are a little stronger than the ones with the Tang. However, they're a little bit, uh, it's more work for the Smith to make a socket than it is to make a Tang. Uh, however, a Tang means that the person affixing the handle has to go through a little more work because they have to, you know, either cut out or drill a hole into the shaft to affix the blade. Uh, in addition to that, if there's a problem with the shaft and it breaks, it's much easier to remove and re-haft a weapon that has a tang as opposed to a socket because you don't really have the, it takes too much time and energy to kind of like re-take the shaft out of a socketed pull arm because it's usually glued in there pretty good. However, whenever we think about Bronze Age P, all these are cast weapons. So the extra effort of, you know, hammering out a socket is not really a consideration whenever everything's cast. Yet, uh, shortly after the P was introduced, a vast majority of them were the Tang design. Uh, so they had the socket at first, but then they kind of dropped it in favor of having a Tang. Now, there's not... I, I suspect that the main reason for this is primarily because there are also uh, bronze Jin that have a Tang. Uh, they don't have cast-on handles. So if you make a bronze Jin with a Tang then it could be attached to a sword staff or it could just function as a sword on its own and it has that kind of versatility to it and i suspect that might be part of the reason why the tang design became so popular so let's say you're digging up a grave and you have you find a bronze gen with a tang how do you tell if it once would belong to a staff or not and was it a sword staff or was it just a sword um, the way that they actually do this is mostly by looking at surrounding context of the burial itself. So is the gin placed next to pole arms or is it on its own little area with some other gin? And that's one key clue. Another thing is that you have to remember one of the key components of the P is to have the end cap. And if you find the end cap somewhere down below and it looks like it belongs to the P, then that is a good indicator that what you have is not a jin, but in fact a sword staff. Because the P is a quite versatile weapon, where it's very good at thrusting and it can also cut and it can be a long pole arm, um, it meant that it saw use both by, you know, on chariots as well as for infantry and for cavalry. So um, we find different lengths of P anywhere from like 1.7 meters all the way up to over 3 meters. So that's like, what, 6 to over 12 feet. And um, the blade on the bronze peep is usually between 30 to 40 centimeters, which is like 12 to 16 inches or so. So as China goes from the Warring States period through the First Emperor and into the Han Dynasty, they transition from, you know, bronze to iron and steel weapons. And the P follows suit. So the main difference that occurs from this transition with the peep is that sometimes the blades can get longer, kind of like this one here. This one is up to 50 centimeters, uh, or 22 inches about. However, sometimes we can find some that are as long as like an 80 centimeter blade, which is like 32 inches. So you can get basically like a very large sword on a, on a shaft. So just like on this shot here, the fittings for P during the Han Dynasty are still made out of copper alloy. Um, however, like I said before, they usually won't be protruding out like this, and there is a couple different kinds. So one is just a simple little bar that's right here on the you know base of the blade. Another kind does have these like zigzag design, which is known as the sawtooth pattern uh, among archaeologists. And the sawtooth pattern is what inspires the eventually the this kind of form of the batwing uh, variant of the shah. But to me, the most interesting thing about the peep is that the iron and steel P of the Han Dynasty appear to have supplanted the spear, particularly during the Western Han period. Uh, now, that's very interesting because uh, it's the only culture in the world that I know of where the spear kind of fell out of favor in form of a sword staff or a cutting spear. And the main evidence that we have for this comes from the arsenal records of an armory of the Western Han Dynasty from the uh, what was known as Donghai Jin or Donghai Province, which is no longer a province in modern China, but the tombs that the records were excavated from were found in uh, Jiangsu Province. Uh, these records, it's like a massive arsenal. It can outfit up to like 500,000 troops. 
And uh, what's fascinating is that they have like a record of 50,000 spears, um, which sounds like a lot, but it doesn't sound like that much whenever you see how many P they recorded. They recorded 440,000 uh, iron P or these cutting spears, sword staffs. Now, the reason I kind of say cutting spears here is because my suspicion is that even though we find many uh, peep from the Han Dynasty, which can be longer, like I said, some even up to 80 centimeters in blade length, my suspicion is that the standard run-of-the-mill infantry peep of this period was probably around the same length as the earlier bronze designs. So the reason that I believe that the standard Han Dynasty infantry peep probably didn't have a blade of like 50 centimeters is because at a certain point it's not becoming very good to function as a spear because it starts to get heavy and you can't get full reach you have to hold the shaft more in the middle than just all the way in the back especially when you're thrusting and you can easily be deflected off point and it's hard to get back on because the weapon's too heavy so I suspect that because the P has replaced the spear in this period it's the, the design of P that's replacing the spear is probably a little shorter and is not a massive, let's say, 80 centimeter blade. I doubt that it's a whole full blown sword blade that's being used as a spear. I suspect that it's a cutting spear or, you know, maybe a 12 inch blade or like 30 centimeter blade that still is not too heavy to function easily as a spear and also has the plus of being able to cut. I should say that this is quite speculative and I don't have solid evidence for the for these P being more spear-like than like uh, the Shah here, uh, but I think that it makes sense in the context of, you know, mass infantry use. And I also think that uh, we can't necessarily trust the art excavated remaining P that we have uh, because we just have a very tiny sample size of the total that existed in the past. And it's extremely difficult to speak about averages of anything in the past whenever we have such a limited sample size to work with. And because the P was kind of the standard infantry weapon for the Western Han Dynasty, uh, I would like to see El Kitchen make a version of it because the Han Dynasty is his thing that he loves. Uh, basically, if he just took one of these blades and slightly shortened it, and made a different guard, he could already pretty much have one. So it's he's almost there, but I would just like to see it maybe as an option uh, for ordering on his site. Now that we've talked about the P, let's come back and focus on the Sha. The Sha here, you know, it has this guard. Some of them have quite large guards. They usually have a pretty good sized blade. And uh, this design here, it largely is influenced by the sawtooth pattern uh, fittings that you can find on Iron P. Because the Shah was never really as popular as the P in the Han Dynasty, uh, many have argued that this means it was probably an elite weapon. Uh, for example, like in the Han Dynasty arsenal, there's like 24,000 Shah as compared to like 440,000 P. So uh, that means that it's just a lot, le a lot less of them around, and it could be an elite weapon. You know, this having a protruding guard does give you more options and. You know, if someone's high, more highly trained, they can more, take advantage of that more readily. So now that the history lesson's over, let's just talk about this example that I have here from LK Chun. It has a folded steel uh, diamond cross-section blade that's 57 centimeters long, so 22 inches. And uh, it's quite sharp. I don't want to touch it because I could cut myself. Uh, moving down, it has a bat wing shape uh, guard made of brass or something, some kind of copper alloy. Um, the finish on it is not the best, but honestly the most impressive thing about this is just the length and the blade itself. So right below the guard we have this wrap. This can be found on some historical P and Sha, um, and this also is super comfortable to hold. The shaft itself is lacquered ash, so it's an ovular cross-section, which is historically accurate. Um, in the past though, many of these shafts would actually not be made out of a single piece of wood. It would actually be a composite like laminated uh, where you have a wooden core with bamboo slats around it and then you might wrap it in a, a fabric and then lacquer over the top. And uh, LK Chen is experimenting with reproducing those and selling them. So in the future, perhaps it will be uh, the Shah 
or some other of his pole arms will be offered with the type of shaft, which is called a B. Moving on to the end cap, the I find the end cap to look quite nice in design, and it's also uh, extremely sturdy feeling. So like other LK10 weapons, this one also comes with a scabbard. The scabbard fits pretty well, and the uh, brass you know, fittings here are actually the sawtooth pattern that you can find on many iron peep. Now let's move on to talk about how these things are used. Now, we don't have any idea how they were used in the Han Dynasty, uh, but what we can do is we can use techniques that we know from contemporary Chinese martial arts, or, or we can kind of just, you know, go with improvisation and just make up techniques. Uh, and doing that, this thing uh, feels very nice if you're holding it a little bit away from the end of the shaft. If you hold it all the way at the end of the shaft, it feels very sluggish. It does not want to move very quick. And you can do long range thrusts with that, but the recovery on those thrusts is quite limited. If someone's really trying to like smack your, your thrust outside, it's going to take a lot of energy and effort to bring it back and get it back online. Uh, so because of that, I think that uh, this thing just functions a lot better if you're holding a little bit further up. And in some ways that actually reminds me of the Guan Dao or the Yan Yue Dao uh, from later Chinese martial arts where those are frequently held right at the base of the blade. And if you do that, the, this type of Sha becomes super maneuverable and you can just go crazy swinging it around and cutting. And in general, you know, it's also possible that this weapon was used in a way similar to the Japanese Naginata where they are constantly kind of doing a switching grip on it. And that's not something I'm very practiced at. Um, I personally would prefer not to do that, but I'm sure that some people are able to make that work for them. Now, if we look at cutting, uh, first thing to say is that this thing cuts extremely well. You have a lot of leverage and speed with such a long shaft, and you also have these two edges, so you can do a lot of fun stuff. Uh, personally, I wasn't really trying to focus on very practical techniques when I was cutting. I was mostly just having fun and seeing what I could do. So I was testing out some techniques from Guandao forms and some other things, and you can see the results for yourself. Alright, so that is the LK10 Han Sha. Uh, as you can see, it cuts very well. There was one time where I, you know, cut a corner out of my cutting stand and didn't even feel it. And then there was another time where, you know, cutting tatami, I cut through the spike and I made it all the way through the whole spike and the mat with a clean cut. 
So that just shows the power that you have with these pull arms. And it's really not in the same class as any sword as far as cutting performance. So if you're interested in getting one of these for yourself, just follow the link to LK Chun's website and you can pick one up. Uh, the main thing with these pull arms is that shipping can be quite cumbersome and tedious and expensive. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, I know that LK Chen is working on trying to get cheaper prices for shipping long pull arms within the United States. Um, so in the future, hopefully a lot of that expense goes down. But for now, you can just take a look for yourself and contact them if you have any questions about that. And with that, I can recommend the LK Chen Hansha. Thank you all for watching. Please subscribe and don't forget to stay sharp.